Welcome back to another episode of the Music Teachers in International Schools podcast. I'm your host, Chris Kulmer, and I'm an ex-head of music at international schools in Argentina and Malaysia, and I'm currently completing a PhD looking at the often complex yet exciting world of music education in international schools. From my many conversations and observations over the years, I believe that international school music educators often find themselves in a unique position to break new ground, to try revolutionary ideas and to truly reform school music education. And this is because we often have the finances and the freedoms to do so. Now, recently I attended the Musical Futures International Big Gig Conference in Bangkok, and I posted a few things online about this uh, because I was there to support what was going on and to really get a feel for uh, Musical Futures in general. And those who have listened to other episodes of the podcast will have maybe heard of the Musical Futures concept uh, discussed before. Now, the conference was in my mind, truly quite exceptional in many ways. It was essentially two full days of making music together. Uh, There was about 40 teachers learning by doing. And we explored challenging questions and tested new ways of doing things. We were singing, playing, jamming, recording, uh, sampling, editing, and mixing. I met so many incredible music educators as well and heard some amazing stories. And as part of the conference, I sat down with as many participants as I could to get to know them and ask one big question. The question was, what do you see as the future of music education? So my guests, which you're going to hear from today, were diverse and their answers were equally so. So this episode is all about exploring this question and mulling some of their responses. The idea is for you to listen to each answer and then think about how you might answer the question yourself. Uh, I'd like to thank all the interviewees for giving their time and their thoughts. Uh, They're all amazing individuals who were so willing. And I might even do more extended episodes with a bunch of these people in the future. So keep an eye out for them. So let's get into it. My first guest was Joe from ICANN International School in Cambodia. And here is her response. So I feel the future of musical future education, sorry. <laughs> it's the future, a bit of a yeah, <laughs> the future of music education is, you know, gearing children to be independent musicians, music makers basically not playing for a, a reason, not, not to have just, a, that's, there has to be a reason to practice, there has to be a reason, you know, to do this, is for my exams and all that, but no, but to actually make peop, um, create children who are passionate for music, very, very independent, and just music lovers, lifelong music lovers, um, that's where I see music education going to. Not uh, meeting the quota of ex- examinations, not, I mean, those are good. Those are like cherry on tops, right? Mm. Cherries on top, right? But not, yeah, just not for the sake of taking exams, not for the sake of, oh, this is my status. This is, you know, but actually create music musicians who love music, passionate about music and their well-being. You know, music is, is a, one of the sources of their well-being. So that's what I would love for all my kids and the kids of the world to have. <laughs> I love it. Bold statement and everyone yeah. in the world. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. Oh. Next up is the director of Musical Futures, Ken Owen. So let's listen to his response. Wow, that's a great question, isn't it? I'd love to see all the answers in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there has to be less rigidity in musical education. There has to be a move from repertoire to, you know, playlist, from, from students' playlist. Now, um, I think the move has to be, not a teachers think they're custodians of a repertoire, mm. but reality is that's a shifting um, dynamic and uh, kids should define the repertoire. And um, music making at its core should be the future of music education, that kids are music makers. Mm. Now, whatever form that takes will evolve won't it you know there'll be mm. so much technology involved never but kids at the core you yeah. know making music with friends yeah so it's uh, it's not a great you know solitary pursuit music really i don't think i think the fun is in uh playing music with your friends yeah so they're the two tenants i think 
should be the future. Yeah, that communal Absolutely. aspect. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. What's more fun than that? Yeah. You know? I then spoke with Evan Britannico, born and raised in the Philippines and now working in an international school in Macau. Quite a legend. And here he is. Well, I guess the the easiest answer, I guess, for that is it's going to be leaning towards more to the digital uh, side, I guess, because mm. uh, I've read somewhere that uh, this the COVID that uh, we're talking, just talking about the COVID, this COVID uh, era basically pushed forward the digital uh, revolution or something, or I mean, in terms of, you know, uh, I mean, uh, online classes, mm. this, this uh, you know, this digit this whole digital uh, education. Because prior to COVID, there were there were some online classes, but it was not mainstream. You know what I mean? Yeah. But right now, everything's online. I mean, everything's selling <laughs> the classes. Everything's done online. So, so I think that's first thing that I could think of. Uh, if you're gonna ask me that question, the future of music education. Next up was Rob Kilvington Shaw, an experienced and innovative music teacher, currently working at Harrow International School in Bangkok. Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. And um, that's something, something to ponder for, you know, a long time, really. Um, the future of music education. Well, I think we still have to continue to look for ways to engage and expose children, engage with them, get them to engage with music, expose them to music. That's what we're here for. That's what we're doing. Now, the way that children are discovering music might be changing. Um, and again, I suppose being here today, I've got that one, one sort of eye on that, that concept, the musical futures concept that children engage with music that they're drawn to, right? So will we have to rethink or re-educate ourselves as teachers on what that is for children perhaps going forwards? I mean, I'm thinking of computer game music, for example. Mm. You know, I'm thinking of this concept we looked at today about as digital technologies have become more and more available to children, perhaps their interaction with music has become a more um, singular individual thing. You know, I don't know. Uh, in other words, I suppose the ways that w which children discover music and connect with music, we have to be mindful of that, I think, and, and provide opportunity for that. Um, because Lucy Green herself said, you know, kids were interested in music. They were playing music. They were they were doing music. They just weren't doing it in school. So why was that? And will will those reasons why they're drawn to music change in the future? Mm. Perhaps you know. So we have to be mindful of that. But I think as long as we are always um, trying to expose children, give them the opportunity to be musicians, really. We're, 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 so it, it, the future might be keep doing what we're doing. If we're doing that well, keep doing what we're doing and then look for ways that we can continue to re-educate ourselves, I suppose, on what makes kids tick musically. That's going to change from generation mm. to generation, is it not? Yeah, yeah. You know, with, with, with the different trends of the times, with different pop culture, with different influences, exposures to all sorts of different things. I mean, not, you know, what, what we were looking at today with Steve in his session about how in 2004, there was no YouTube, there was no Spotify, there weren't even smartphones, and that's not that long ago. But I think we're doing that as teachers. I think we are keeping on top of those mm. trends. Do you not think? Yeah, no, I think so. Mm. Yeah, and sometimes I even feel like some of the more recent uh, changes or growth, especially in that COVID era where we went so online in mm. so many ways, the way that some of those online DAWs just kind of like went straight yeah. to the floor and we just like, this is, this is our yeah. thing, let's go for it and let's yeah. try it and use it. Sure. And I feel like now I'm hearing people outside of education starting to talk about these DAWs that we've been using for ages. Mm. Whereas I used to feel like it was the other way around, mm -hmm. that you'd be sort of behind all the time or something. But sometimes I feel like we're kind of either at the forefront in many ways. <laughs> well, we didn't go and find anything that never existed. During mm. COVID, we went out and we found tools to teach within the situation we find ourselves in. And those tools were always there. And actually, in my practice anyway, and in lots of practices I've seen, were already utilized in a classroom environment. DAWs, you know, I mean, even things like, I don't know, loop stations and stuff. Mm. You know, the technology's always been there, I think, yeah. in, in, in the music classroom. Certainly since I became a music teacher. Mm. I appreciate before my time, I think I've been teaching for about 12 
13, 14 years now. So, you know, not a, not a really long period of time. But certainly in that period, we've always had those tools there. We just repackaged them to sit, um, suit the context we were in. Yeah. And then I kept hearing lots of people saying, right, what, what do we need to keep hold of? This has been great, actually. This has been such a, you know, such um, an advancement in in uh, educational practice. But I, I think maybe you're right. I think music teachers have always been at the forefront of that potential, mm. perhaps. I don't know. It's yeah. these are great questions to ponder and conversations to have. <laughs> I don't think there's anything we need to radically change. I think we're doing it. I think we are a really good example of how you can teach quite progressively. Yeah. I think your point about relearning or unlearning, mm. that's a really good one. And that's come up a couple of times, interestingly enough. Mm. It's this idea of well, we don't need to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah. Because it's like maybe we're doing some great stuff. It's just that openness to relearn and unlearn. And you also mentioned the word context, like mm -hmm. being aware of our context. How is that fitting in with all this as well? Do you know what? If we have to, if we have to throw anything out, or for want a better term, I think it might be the music itself, as in our music. You mm. know, my taste has to stay at the door. I've I've felt that way. Not 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 exclusively. Not not not. It's not a blanket rule I have, but often. I'm putting my taste at the door when I walk in. I'm letting the kids bring their taste in. I'm mm. letting them bring their relationship with music in, right? And maybe that's the thing that we have to keep recycling. We have to keep reimagining, mm. you know? Um, of course, there's a flip side of that where then I'm hoping that I might be able to influence students or expose them at least to things that they would never have found or, or, or come across before. But I think our actual pedagogical practices, the way that we go about being musical with students being musicians with students that's that's solid mm. i feel that's good the part that might need to evolve is the musical context within which we do that i then had a really nice chat with Lindsay, a fellow aussie and currently working in chiang mai well, it's a big question. Uh, in some ways, it kind of feels like the future's already here because, I mean, the big thing is, uh, I guess, the uh, music composition, AI stuff that's yeah. been happening, right? Everyone's like, oh my gosh, is, is creativity now becoming obsolete and everyone's <laughs> sort of panicking. So, that, I mean, I think that's the most interesting thing to to look out for in the future is like the the creative side of things because up until then it's like well the the revolution for learning online has already been here for a while mm. but but these self-composing uh ai bots i mean it's it's kind of scary in a way <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question isn't it because like what are we going to do as music educators to incorporate that ai potential yeah right? how do we do we embrace it or do we you know there's a certain level where we kind of have to you know yeah. like the internet you know you can hold off from that and people did hold off for it 20 years ago and then it just becomes inevitable so mm. it, you know that's probably going to be the same thing and you just sort of have to learn to live with it chris mcclay then joined me for what was a rather insightful discussion focused on innovations in primary music here's what he had to say um i think i know what i'd like to see <laughs> let's go <there. laughs> musical futures there's a lot of um performance arts becoming a thing where you, it's arts and drama and music sort of all enrolled into one role mm. and i think there's people that do it fantastic and and all that but i find that that time starts to reduce it'd be nice to try and i hope that music can stay strong as its own entity sort of thing you know so it's not like you wouldn't put mass physics and biology and wrap that all into under one sort of thing mm. if that makes sense um, i think it, it could happen is that um there is no sort of separate class like kids can just sort of go around and like uh, instrument is just as available as a book mm. you can just grab it and i'm over here if you want me to help you that kind of thing or just just a bit more of that that flow that it's always there having stages always set up around the place where live things can happen at any time it's like mm. pick the class up all right we're going to go perform for these guys let's do it rochelle was next she was somewhat of an icon at the conference having flown in from the tiny town of katanning in Western Australia. You can look that up on the map to find out where that is. Just Google that one. Katanning with a K. Rochelle works in a highly multicultural community and had some incredible insights and stories about how she's approached arts education in this small town. Here's her response. The future of music education is ultimately, it's part of all cultures. We have to remember that. 
and it's the history of all cultures and it's probably singing was probably the first instrument ever when you think about it mm. that way so i think technology has progressed and it's i mean as we speak there's new stuff being invented all the time mm. but ultimately for as a music educator or an arts educator we have to keep it still practical and we have to be able to enjoy showing children the pathway into music and being able to enjoy music and express themselves musically or artistically as we can. That, that's never going to die. I think it, we just need to make sure that we embrace that and understand that we need to keep being practical about it and we still need the hands-on mm. experience as well. So technology can keep going, but we still need to be able to start with the voice, start with body percussion and then see where that leads us. Mm. And that's where all children need to start there, I think. I guess, I guess that's where I'm coming from is I want the children to experience the joy of singing, the joy of dance, the joy of participating and being part of a group to make music or art and or art <laughs> or both. <laughs> Everything. Throw it Everything, all yeah. yeah. Uh, culmination in our end of year yeah. uh, music productions maybe. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah I just enjoy being a human and expressing ourselves. Yeah. in that creative musical way. So it's like almost, if I'm getting it right, it's almost you're saying the future is is the simplicity of yes. participation, enjoyment, yep. doing. Just using our voice yeah. and being able to use that musically. I think we've got to start with that. Mm. And I think from about our sessions this morning with singing just brought that home to me. I think that's so important. Yeah. I mean, all the other stuff, learning an instrument... All that kind of stuff can happen a bit later, but the fundamental part of expressing ourselves who we are um, from the music that we've already been born with. I then had the privilege of speaking with Jason Holmes, aka DJ Sizzle, who was the keynote speaker at the conference. This is someone that we all need to check out, go and find him online. Uh, and here was his response. I hope the future of music education is going in every direction. I, I sometimes sense a little bit of pushback from more traditional music teachers when it, when it comes to technology, as though I'm trying to replace, or, or mu I should say not I, music technology is trying to replace classical trumpet or, you know, those instruments that are so well known. Um, a discussion we were having earlier is music technology is just something that's become it's not something that is evolving it's something that ha continues to evolve mm. so a trumpet is music technology yeah. right yeah so we're just on a path yeah it's like a it's, spectrum it's like yeah. the trumpet was this part of the music technology s spectrum and now it's moved yeah and and you wouldn't you wouldn't say oh i'm mad at a trumpet because it's replaced a mm. flute We've now got a flute and a trumpet. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, 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 in in the spirit of that Ableton modular approach, and synthesis modular approach, I I think these tools, these instruments, these traditional you know backgrounds and and uh, musical theory have as much of a place in modern music technology as ever. But we can just also add that and start feeding it back into itself in an incredible way. I watched a, a video of one of the students of a teacher that's attending the conference today and I was blown away. He was using Ableton and, and a push and he, you know, started with a basic drum pattern and then just layered sound on sound on sound and sang on it. And it's like, man, he is not just playing an instrument. He's playing all the instruments. And in fact, I don't know, but there's a good possibility that he has created unique new instruments in the process and is playing those. I just, that's so exciting. That's and I, so I cool. want to, I want to see all of those things meld with traditional and, and, you know, um, more traditional forms of music teaching. So that's, that's my hope. <laughs> I, I think it's happening. I think it's happening. It takes time though, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, a, you know, an interesting conversation that you and I were having is about 
how, how education, it takes a while to define something, I think, to be able to include it mm. in education. So we were talking about hip hop and how hip hop really, and maybe uh, this is more in Australia. I know hip hop has been in education in the US for, for a, a long time now, but it's only really just making its way into education 50 years after its first inception. Yeah. Something to think about. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it doesn't take that long no. for you know, other modern technology. It's a really great thought. Next up was Fiona, a South African working in China with a background in jazz. Fiona's response was amazing. We had a long conversation. Uh, and then you will hear Fiona threw the question to me and I gave my best shot and an answer to the question. In terms of my own thinking, I would say that a lot more of this would be a lot better for kids. <laughs> you know, um, Full stop. <laughs> a lot more of this would be a lot better for kids because, I mean, they've summed it up. When you ask a kid to choose a song, they're not going to choose a fugue by Bach. They're going to choose, you know, Flowers by Miley Cyrus because, yeah. you know, that's their experience of music. Unless you have parents who are very into that kind of music and, sure. uh, you know, or, uh, you know, you grow up listening to that kind of Western, uh, you know, classical music. And then the other thing I think about is I think a lot of the time in these international schools, although we are taking into uh, account our context, we are and we try to be respectful of the context and the country and we try to bring in elements of the music the cultural cultural music of the country um it still is very again it's based on who we are western centered mm. in terms of what we're teaching mm. and and honestly I, I as a, a western based teacher who has grown to hugely respect and understand um uh, chinese music uh i, I couldn't teach it though mm. <laughs> you sure. know yeah. i couldn't teach it though but um there's i would say in international schools that in general I mean, there might be schools who have better programs. It's still, I would say, like an 80-20. It's 80% Western-based because of those curriculums. Yeah. 20% is... Sometimes I feel like ticking a box. We have to represent the culture that we're in. And, and possibly in some schools, it's not ticking a box. It's we want to represent that culture. But there is that feeling mm. that I get. You know, we have to respect the culture we're in. But we're a Western... We're an IB curriculum. So we need to teach IB music. And that's more Western-based, you know. So where does where do we go? I don't know. Because... We've got curriculums in formal schools, unless those curriculums change, and that would be the people who design curriculums, unless their thinking changes in the international school system, I don't know mm. where it's going to go. It's going to really depend on where they go. Yeah. So you need the people at the top to be thinking about this in terms of where is mu music education going. Less formal schools, um, I think it can go wherever you want it to go, perhaps. If you're doing it privately or you've got your own music schools, it can go anywhere you like it to go. Uh, if you're constrained by curriculums um, and top-down direction, it's got to go where they say it's got to go. And possibly that's, as I say, why I like being in the middle school because, uh, and, and why I like the IB actually and the MYP because they give you a framework and then the rest is up to you, right? Yeah. So you've got that freedom to teach whatever you want as long as you teach within that framework and they meet those standards. Especially uh, the new IB course, right? Yeah, and the, in the new IB DP course yeah, DP, yeah. finally Yay, <laughs> has <content>. aligned <laughs> with the rest of the arts, drama and, and visual art. And although I don't teach it anymore, um, I'm, I'm watching it through my colleagues and I'm pleased to see that it's so much better now. What are your thoughts? I'm just curious. Well, as in, where's the future of music Where's education? the future of music going? What's your thoughts? Um, I resonate a lot with what you're talking about with curriculum, and I'm very interested in that space, and I'm involved in a lot of conversations around that space. Mm. Some of the conversation that was coming from you and was triggering thoughts in my mind was around this organization that I'm connected with called the Coalition to Honor All Learning, yeah, which is coming out of Europe, essentially, but it's very much a global group. and. The International School of Geneva, um, they're sort of heading up this whole thing of reforming high stakes assessment in international schools mm. and international schools kind of leading the way in that. Mm. And they're working directly with universities and working with the curriculum providers to try and change something because it's not just music that's experiencing this um, constraint right, potentially. Right, right. So that's exciting. So yeah. I'm oh, seeing yeah, the, that is good. Yeah. So the future that I'm seeing is that the conversations are happening. That people want change, yes. that people are trying things and yep. creating coalitions and groups and things right. to make these changes happen. And that it's not just from 
the teachers, it's coming from administrators, and it's coming from the university side as well. Well, it needs to, right? Yeah. Because everything we're doing in the high schools is to prepare those kids for the universities. 100%. And the universities have requirements. So right. until something changes there, it's not going to filter down. So when right? you were talking like the top, the top down, yeah. it's like it even goes to the next level to tertiary, Correct. and then Correct. it goes to the next level to right. business. Right. right, right. Because this disconnect between tertiary and business, where all university is doing is to prepare you for a job. Right. And we don't know what those jobs are. Exactly. Especially <laughs> now, right? In this day and age, right? wow. So it's this full-on like mm. deconstruction of mm. the system, mm. which is a huge concept. But It's, it's another whole rabbit hole, right? It's <laughs> but it's cool to talk about. So right. when we think about music, I get really excited about where the IB DP has gone. That's exciting. Well, that's, that is, as you that found. is so much. And then I'm just really excited about where things like social media and music production is taking music. Mm. I think it's... You know, the stuff we were seeing with Jason, DJ Sizzle, where he's yep. sampling and he's using stuff on on the push and Ableton. And yep. um, I think that's just so cool in it terms is. of accessibility. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's still pricey to get some of that tech, but it's getting cheaper. It's getting more accessible. Things like Soundtrap and BandLab mm -hmm. and all these different DAWs in, in the computer. There's a lot of scope now to really open up music from some of the stuff we were talking about earlier. Yep. like. Eurocentric classical degrees being right. the only way in yes. to now like, here's a million ways in. Yep. And it's all about fun and enjoyment. Right. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. It's a little bit different to what we've had in the past. And again, just some food for thought, some ideas, some challenges to the question of what is the future of music education? If you have a thought you'd like to add, if you would like to give us your two cents about what you think the future of music education looks like, please uh, send us a comment. You can send me a video. You can send us a voice um, snippet, whatever you like, get in touch. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think the future of music education is. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Music Teachers in International Schools podcast. Listen to other episodes by visiting MT iis.com or learn more about our community on Facebook by simply searching for music teachers in international schools. If you know someone who you think I should get on the podcast, I'd love to hear from you. You can find me at chriskulma.com C-H-R-I-S-K-O-E-L-M-A.com. See you next time.